Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, fe feel free to continue to, uh, to eat um, throughout uh, the event tonight. So I'm Adam Seagrave. Uh, I'm the Associate Director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership and also of the Center for Political Thought and Leadership within the school, which is sponsoring this event. <clears throat> so this is the inaugural event in our Women in Leadership series, a new speaker series. Uh, as many of you are no doubt aware, in 2018, there were record numbers of women candidates for political office, both at the state and national levels. Thank you. <clears throat> After the recent midterms, there are now more women in Congress than at any other time in American history. As someone who lives in a house full of strong and amazing women, ranging in age from two to over 20, which is speci as specific as I'm allowed to get. Um, <laughs> I'm very personally invested in this development. As the university's civic leadership school, we at the C School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership are eager to respond to this exciting development by offering a new and unique brand of leadership education for a new class of women leaders in politics, business, and civic life. Our curriculum is designed to educate the leaders of free citizens in the American Democratic Republic. Because we live under a free government, we need to educate for freedom, and that means a liberal or freeing education. That's what we aim to provide through our focus on the discussion of classic works, both by male and by female authors, which deal directly with the big questions of human life. For the students in the audience, I invite you to take a look at the various materials about the school and our courses that are available uh, just outside the doors. I also hope that everyone has had a chance. You haven't yet, but you will uh, afterwards, hopefully, to see our amazing original texts over here in this corner of, of the room. Uh, we have a first edition of the History of Women's Suffrage, signed by Susan B. Anthony herself. Uh, pretty amazing. And we also have an 1848 newspaper printing from Frederick Douglass's North Star newspaper of the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments, of excerpts from the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments. So I'd encourage you uh, after our event, there will be uh, some time um, to hang around, go look at those amazing original texts. Um, and thank you to Kathy and to the library staff for arranging their presence here tonight and for saving them from the flames uh, recently. Um, <clears throat> All right, so our distinguished speaker this evening will be introduced by one of our excellent students, Hannah Salem. Hannah is an Arizona native and third year undergraduate studying public service and public policy with a women and gender studies minor, and also as of earlier today with a minor in civic and economic thought and leadership. <laughs> Throughout her time at ASU, she has served in a variety of leadership positions within undergraduate student government, Tempe, and currently serves as director of civic engagement. Undergraduate student government serves the undergraduate student body of Arizona State University Tempe campus by representing the concerns and needs of the students to the ASU administration, the Arizona Board of Regents, and the state legislature. Hannah recently became involved with the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership after traveling to India on a service and leadership global intensive experience where she was able to learn about cross-cultural collaboration and promote the importance of gender equality. Hannah. Hello everyone, like Dr. Seagrave introduced me, my name is Hannah Salem. If your back is turned to me, I highly encourage you to turn your chairs towards the speaker. Um, and it is with a great honor that I get to introduce Christine Jones today for this event. Christine Jones is the former Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary for GoDaddy. She is the current Chief Operating Officer and the prostate of the Prostate Cancer Foundation the world's leading philanthropic organization dedicated to the research and eradication of prostate cancer. Christine is also the founder and the chief executive officer of Big Fork Technologies, a legal tech company specializing in fully customizable cloud-based solutions for legal departments. Prior to GoDaddy, Christine worked for a Phoenix law firm and the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. Christine is an adjunct professor of law at the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law at ASU. She has been a great lecturer 
a guest lecturer at a variety of law schools, graduate business schools, colleges, and universities, and high schools, including Stanford University, the University of Virginia, Arizona State University, Santa Clara University, Whittier Law School, and many others. She is a published author and served as editor-in-chief of the Whittier Law Review. She resides in Phoenix with her husband, Gary Jones, a retired Air Force officer who runs the AFJ ROTC program at a local high school. Christine is a Christine is a policy enthusiast, philanthropist, occasional Republican, political candidate, and entrepreneur. She is always looking for a way to serve. You can follow her on Twitter at C Jones and Facebook, Christine Jones. So without further ado, if you guys could give her a round of applause for Christine Jones. Thank you, Hannah. Hi, I'm Christine Jones, and this is the first time I've ever followed a fire alarm. <laughs> so I have to be better than it. That is my goal tonight. When Arizona was seeking status as a state, the Constitutional Convention was started each day with a prayer. And on day two of the convention, the chaplain, whose name was Chaplain Seaborn Crutchfield, which is not germane to the talk, I just like saying his name. He prayed the following prayer, among other things. We pray thee, O Lord, that this body of men, the representatives of the people of the state of Arizona, would adopt such a constitution as would be acceptable to every citizen, and that it would grant unto Arizona statehood and place her among the grand galaxy of states in these United States, and that Arizona would be the brightest star in the Union. And I read that and I thought, is it possible that this prayer from 1912 would sum up how we should live our lives in 2019? Because you see, it only takes a little bit of light to light up a lot of darkness. And women, with all due respect to the men in the room, have been lighting up darkness for millennia. And if you take some recent examples, regardless of your political affiliation, you have to agree that two good ones would be the justices who sit on the Supreme Court, from Sandra Day O'Connor to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Lots of women lighting up lots of light. Now, a lot has been said about me in the past few years. Some of it started with GoDaddy executive, some starts with Republican candidate for governor, some of it starts with Republican candidate for Congress, Great Hearts chief executive, CEO of the Prostate Cancer Foundation, entrepreneur, philanthropist, law professor, on and on and on. But long before any of that, I was just a scrappy little freckle-faced redheaded kid growing up in Southeast Denver. Does anybody know what it means when I say Southeast Denver? You do. So Southeast Denver is about as far away from Scottsdale as one can grow up. And we grew up with two wonderful parents. But we didn't have much. Anybody here grew up poor? Anybody grew up poor that didn't know they were poor? Right, that was us. So we didn't have a whole lot, but what I did have was a really smart aunt, my mom's sister, my Aunt Anne. And she used to say, you know, Christine, if you ever want to get up out of Southeast Denver, make something out of yourself, you need to get an education. And she was right. She, so many times she would say, education is the great equalizer. So for those of you who raised your hand, I honor you for being in the room today because you're gonna do what I did. You're gonna work really hard and you're gonna get an education and maybe, just maybe, find some success as a result. But you gotta be the hardest working guy, you know. So 
I usually say three things whenever I stand up and talk in public. I'll shorten it to two because of the fire drill. Just, no, I won't. Just kidding. And they are these. And if you tweet, these are the three things you should tweet. If you Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat or anybody else do any other social media platforms we need to mention, these are the three things you should mention. And when you tag me, you should tag at C Jones, C J O N E S S E Jones. That's free advertising. <laughs> and there is a, not a Twitter handle on there, but there is one for this group. These are the three things. So write these down, make these a mental note, do whatever you have to do, and then you can put your papers away. Okay, they are the following. People treat you the way you let them treat you. People treat you the way you let them treat you. Number two, do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And number three, God bless you, stop talking about it and just do it. Stop talking about it and just do it. Those are the three things. Now you can put your pencils down. So long before I was any of those things that I just mentioned, and I was that scrappy little kid growing up in, red, in uh, southeast Denver, and I went off to join the Air Force, and I wanted to get an education. I met a really nice guy who was already on active duty, so I got out of the, the Air Force program there, and we moved around the country as a military family. And I wanted to go to law school. I knew I wanted to go to law school, but the thing that happens when you're in the military is they move you around all the time. So you apply to law school in this place, and then you get sent to that place, and you apply to law school there, and you get sent to the other place. It's very frustrating. So finally I said, okay, we're going to try to get stationed in Los Angeles. I'm going to apply to law school in Los Angeles, and regardless of what happens, I'm going to law school in Los Angeles. Well, it just happened by our great good fortune that the Air Force sent us there. So I was getting ready to go to law school. And back in the day, in the Dark Ages, you had to read this intolerably huge stack of books before you went to law school. You were not to report on day one until you had read those law books. And if you've seen Legally Blonde, she didn't follow the rules. <laughs> so I was, <laughs> I'm reading all these books, and some of them were pretty dry. And I had the television on, and there was a news story that was going over and over and over all day long, and I'm reading this. God bless you again. Do you need a tissue or anything? No, OK, you good. All right. There was this news story, and it kept going. And I was sort of half paying attention, half not. And, and it was getting to be around the time that my husband should come from home from work. And he's a military guy, and he's very disciplined, and he's always on time. And he wasn't coming home, and he wasn't coming home. And this was before we had cell phones, and <laughs> we were super fancy because we had pagers. <laughs> but it, I didn't know what was going on. He didn't call me, he didn't call me, he didn't call me. Finally, he comes home. He's like, you are never going to believe what I just saw. He said, here I was driving down the 405. Every overpass had people. There were people lining the freeway. And coming up the other side of the road was this white Bronco. There must have been 25 police cars following this white Bronco. And I said, that's funny, because that's exactly the story that I've been watching on the news all day. You have just seen OJ Simpson and Al Cowlings driving down the 405 in this blow speed chase. That was the context of what was going on when I was getting ready to go to law school. Now, I wanted to be a prosecutor. And I knew I wanted to be a prosecutor. I wanted to put the bad guys in jail. Except after the OJ case happened, and it became ubiquitous on television, everybody else wanted to be a prosecutor too. So I thought, all right, what am I going to do to make myself stand out to get a job at the prosecutor's office? So I started calling them every single day. And I found out the woman who was in charge of recruiting, her name was Kathy, I started calling her on the phone every single day. Now keep in mind, there were no cell phones. I actually had to go outside the law school to the pay phone to do this. And I would put the quarter in and I would call her up and pretty soon she stopped answering the phone. And then pretty soon her voicemail got full. So not even the voicemail would pick up anymore because it was full of what? 
messages for me. And so I started to get frustrated because I thought, now all these people from Harvard and Stanford and Princeton that are applying to the DA's office, they're going to get my job. It's my job. I want to be a prosecutor. So I thought, okay, what am I going to do to figure out a way to do this? Well, there was a job fair over at USC one day. I know you're not supposed to mention that school here, but just go with the story. So I thought, well, I'll just go down there because they were, it was public interest law and people who helped migrant farm workers and homeless people and, you know, abused women and things like that, landlord-tenant disputes. I thought, let me just go over there and see what's going on. Well, guess what? Kathy was there with a booth at USC. Yes. So I walked up to her with my little suit, my little briefcase. I said, hi, I'm Christine Jones. She goes, oh, <laughs> you're the one that's been calling me every single day. I said, yeah, you know what? I really want to work for the DA's office. And she said, well, you seem like a lovely person, but we don't hire first year law students. And I said, that's OK. <laughs> she said, but you don't get to make the rules. So she basically dismissed me and went on to the next person in line. And while she wasn't watching, I kind of went over and stole her business card put it in my pocket. This is a Saturday. So Monday morning, I drive down to the criminal courts building. Now, this is an important caveat. I'm not suggesting you do this, okay? This was before September 11th. Security was much different then. I went to the criminal courts building and I basically broke in. Okay, so I went through the security and I looked at her card and this is back before stalking was even a law. So they actually still put their room number on their card. Big mistake. So I find out the floor, and I go up to the floor. Now I'm locked in the elevator lobby, because you have to have a code to get into the floor. So again, here I am, my little briefcase, my little suit, looking all official. And some two guys come walking off the elevator, so I'm just following them right into the door. Now I'm in the hallway, and I'm looking at the room numbers on the thing. And I find her room. And guess what? She's in there. So I go up and I knock. I stand there. Okay, now picture the government scene. Metal desks stacked high with resumes from all of those people who want my job. Okay. She can barely see over the papers. And she looks up briefly and then she, literally she startles. And I said, hi, I'm Christine Jones. I really want to work for the DA's office. She said, I know who you are. We don't hire first year law students. And I said, you don't understand. I really, really want to work here. And I will do anything. I'll take out your trash. I'll scrub your floors. I'll file your papers and I'll do it for free. I just want to work at the DA's office. So just then, her phone started to ring. Well, keep in mind, the voicemail's never picking up because it's full of messages from me. So it's ringing and ringing, and she's looking at the phone, and she's looking at me. I know what she's thinking. She's thinking, Okay, if I answer the phone, I can't call security to have her escorted out of here. But it was super awkward. So I just sort of very gently, calmly, without making too much alarming motion, walked over to her desk, picked up the phone, and said, Kathy Music's office, may I help you? No, I'm sorry she's in a meeting right now, but I'll be happy to leave her a message. Absolutely, I'll have her call you right back. Is there anything else you need help with? She was that quiet because she thought I was a freak. So I just sort of gently walked over to the other desk in her office, which was also stacked high with papers, and sat down and started working. And I emptied the trash, and I cleaned all the dishes, and I filed all the papers. And at the end of the day, it got to be about 5 o'clock, I picked up my briefcase and left came back the next day and I did the same thing and the next day after that and the next day after that and the next day after that and every single day for two solid weeks 
when I wasn't sitting in class, I was sitting at that desk working. So <laughs> we're getting to, <laughs> to the end of the Friday on the second week. And she finally looks over at me, exasperated. Now every paper is filed. Every letter has been sent, including rejecting all of those people who wanted my job. <laughs> Everything is, I mean, it is, I'm OCD, so it was perfectly filed, just beautifully. And everything's clean. And she looks over and she says, you're really serious about this whole working at the DA's office thing, huh? I'm like, you're just not figuring this out, really? I said, yeah, I really, really, really want to work here. I just want to learn. She goes, okay, you win. She picks up the phone, calls upstairs to a guy named Alan, and she says, I have this crazy, I mean, I have this law clerk down here who wants to work, and she wants to work for free. Do you need her? Well, he's like, are you kidding me? We're the government. We have no money. Send her up. So I don't think to this day that he knows that I was a first-year law student, but whatever. We'll let that slide. So we go upstairs. She introduces me. We walk down the hall. He says, this is where you're going to sit. And, and it's, do you guys know what a typewriter stand was? Anybody know what a typewriter? I know some of us do. <laughs> well, typewriter stand was sort of like a TV tray. It was about this big. He goes, this is your desk. You sit here, and there's a guy named Alan, the second Alan, who has this office, and he'll come in, and he'll tell you what to do. So he's, I guess, in court or something, and I'm sitting in there, and I'm oh, okay, well, I filed his papers and washed his dishes and scrubbed his floor and emptied his trash. His was way worse than hers, by the way. And he comes in, and he was like, oh, my gosh, what happened to my office? And well, I cleaned it. So he said, so you're the law clerk. And I said, yep, I'm the law clerk, apparently. He said, well, you see that envelope over there? I want you to take it and tell me what's on the tape in there. And there was a, a tape player with some headphones. And I said, well, do you, want, do you need a transcript? Because here I was like demanding to be put in, in place, but I didn't know how to make a transcript. He said, no, it's a, it, there's an official transcriptionist that's going to do it. I just want to know what it says because we're preparing for a hearing. So I put the tape in, put the headphones on. I hit play. It is the interview that O.J. Simpson did with Phil Van Adder and Tom Lang the night he flew back from Chicago after murdering his wife, and Ron Goldman. That was my first official job at the DA's office. There is no reason a scrappy little freckle-faced red-headed kid should grow up to work on the O.J. Simpson case, except that people treat you the way you let them treat you. Earn respect. Give respect. Be polite, work hard, but no, people treat you the way you let them treat you every single time. Now, I found it ironic that when I ran for governor, my opponent ran a series of ads saying I never worked at the DA's office after having worked there for three years. But this is what happens in politics, you know? The craziness of politics takes over. So I was minding my own business, and I thought I would probably go ahead and, and stay there when I got recruited to come to a firm in Phoenix. And I'm a CPA, and I got recruited to go, a firm, go to a firm here that was doing securities litigation. It was a great fit between the two degrees, and I did that for a number of years. And then out of the blue, I got recruited to go to this tiny little internet startup company with the crazy name GoDaddy. And before I ever even started, the founder called me and he said, you know, I have a, a woman here who called me and she found a naked picture of herself on the internet. Now keep in mind, this is late 2001. People didn't know what domain names were. People were using AOL.com email addresses almost ubiquitously. There was no social media. Facebook.com literally had not been registered yet, let alone invented. There was sort of a Google. There was none of these. There was kind of a Blackberry. It was about twice this big. It had like the little paddle on the side. Technology was not where it is now. So he says, what should I do? Should I leave it up or take it down? I said, well, I don't know, Bob. I'm a securities litigator. Let me go look it up. So I go look it up, and there's no law. 
on this issue back in late 2001. And I thought, well, that's good genius. You've just taken a job to interpret law that doesn't exist. Good job. But when I started to look around at what was going on on the internet, it turned out that there weren't many big technology companies doing anything in the policy arena. Well, it didn't take a genius to see, clearly I wasn't because I took a job to interpret law that didn't exist. It didn't take a genius to see that this train was coming and it was coming fast. And somebody was gonna have to do something with policy. But nobody was doing anything, so I just went and set up a shop in Washington and started going out there a week, a month, and trying to build out the framework of policy that now governs the internet. <laughs> now that you know me, you should be terrified to know that I was making policy for the whole internet. But this took a lot of people. Lots of coalitions of lots of people in lots of different contexts. And you know when you develop policy, there's no such thing as partisan policy, at least not good policy. It all needs to be done with people from both sides of the aisle. And I would have bills that were co-sponsored by John McCain and Hillary Clinton, for example. While they were running against each other for president, they didn't like each other that day, but they both thought it was a good idea to protect kids online. And I had bills that were co-sponsored by Dianne Feinstein and Orrin Hatch. They don't see eye to eye on very many things, except that they thought it was bad that we had fake pharmaceuticals being sold online, so we got that bill done. And lots and lots and lots of other things in other contexts with lots of people in the industry. And when we rolled the tape forward and eventually sold the company a little bit more than a decade later, there were over a thousand companies that were domain name registrars, thousands and thousands doing website hosting. Lots of social media companies, lots of people doing database. I mean, many, many, many thousands of technology companies who could have cared about policy. You know how many of them had an active full-time policy development shop in Washington? Take a guess. Exactly one. It was GoDaddy. Now, there were plenty of people that would say like, Ugh, there's child pornography on the internet. Somebody should really do something about that. Our kids are getting drugs on fake pharmacy sites and overdosing and God forbid dying. Somebody should do something about that. Anybody here know somebody like that? Been a couple kids in Phoenix lately that have succumbed to drugs that they bought online that were fake. Ugh, somebody should really do something about that. Lots of people who were well-intentioned, and community-minded and good-hearted saying somebody should really do something about that. But there was exactly one company that was devoting its resources and time to actually doing it. You know why? Because sometimes you gotta stop talking about it and just do it. Stop talking about it. You might fail. It might take you more than one try. You might go to see a senator whose name shall remain nameless, but it rhymes with Lindsey Graham, who says, I'm not meeting with you because you're the people with the goofy logo and the silly name and the girl with the tank top, and you're not serious. You might have to do it more than once, but stop talking about it and just do it. Because if you don't, how's it going to get done? I guarantee it's going to have to be led by women. There are lots of good intended men, right? Great, good people that they just needed somebody to catch hold of that vision and go run with it. Stop talking about it. Just do it. You might fail. OK. It's all right. Stop talking about it. Now, after we sold the company, I started to be encouraged to run for office. I guess, you know, I was testifying in Congress a lot with all my time in DC and showing up on C-SPAN and people see you there and they say, hey, when you think about running for office? And when somebody says, when you think about running for office, you say, uh, soon. Well, that's not what I said. <laughs> I said, uh, no, absolutely not. Who would want to do that? 
but the noise got loud enough and eventually you know the end of the story now I did run for governor and I went from basically zero I'd never run for office before I went from zero to leading in the polls in about seven months and people started to talk about me like I was going to be the next governor and the paper would publish stories saying oh you know here's the agenda and all this good stuff and and it's a very interesting thing that happens when you're leading in the polls. People start to want to be your friend. They start to give you stuff. And some of it's stuff about your opponent. And random envelopes would get slid under our door, and pictures would get sent to us, and stories would get told to us, and phone calls would come into the office. And some of the stuff was pretty damaging to my opponent. But you know what I thought? And I had told my staff, I'll do what I have to do, and I'll go where I have to go, and I'll say what I have to say, and I will work harder than any other candidate, and I did. But I will not do something that requires me to compromise my integrity. And if I have to lose because of that, then I have to lose. And in the end, that's kind of what happened. Because none of those stories that any of those people told me were my story to tell. That's their story. So those stories remain untold, and I don't know if they'll ever be told. Maybe, maybe not. Those are not my stories to tell. Which brings me to, and I need to wrap up, the third point, which is, even when it's tempting not to, you have to do the right thing. Not because you get something out of it. Not because it makes you money, or it gives you power, or it builds your ego. You just have to do the right thing every single time just because it's right. And if you do, if you finish well, you'll live to fight another day. And I did, and so I will, and so will you. And I'm going to wrap up with this. Let's talk about the hashtag me too thing for one second. I posted a, a link to this event on my Facebook page. Now, I don't have a huge following, something like 55,000 followers, but I posted it out there. Just said, all right, if you want to come, great. If you want to stream, we're streaming this live on Facebook. Hi, Facebook. Join us. You should have seen some of the comments that people put on my Facebook because the title of this talk had hashtag me too in it. Anything from the Me Too movement is complete bullshit to, can we believe that? <laughs> to, just was a quote, to hashtag pound Me Too, um, to every, well, I think some of it's just too violent, disgusting to say, but it's interesting what happens when a movement catches on. And because you're in a program that is focusing on policy, and presumably from a liberal arts perspective, I really want you to leave here thinking about the following. If the liberal arts world is really about pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness, and challenging you to think, and teaching you to think, and helping you to help others to learn how to think, What could be more important when there's a movement like hashtag me too than refusing to draw a conclusion until you know all the facts? That really is the liberal in liberal arts. Refusing to draw the conclusion until you know all the facts. Because one of the reasons that some of those vile comments came up it's not that people don't think bad stuff happened. It's that if everything is a sexual assault, then nothing is a sexual assault. If everything is discrimination, nothing is discrimination. If everything is a problem, nothing is a problem. So you have to force yourself, especially in the academic setting, where everybody is trying to figure out what's happening in the future and challenging thought and, and 
sort of grasping for a definition of what's coming next, you have to force yourself to say, I'm going to attach myself to the truth and to fact and not let yourself get swept up in a movement, no matter how meaningful the overarching concept might be. Because if everything is a problem, nothing is a problem. I think we have time for a few questions, but I want to leave you with one final thing. You know how, what's your favorite social media these days? Insta? Yeah, yeah, yeah OK. So you know how people just post memes? Some of them you just scroll right past, and you think, why are you polluting my timeline with that? But once in a while, you see one that you think, oh, that's really cute. So I saw this on St. Patrick's Day. It was green, and it had lots of four-leaf clovers, and it was very happy and festive. And I, and I started to read it, and it says, and I thought, oh, this actually is something that I would say. It says this, no matter how hard I work or how well I've had it planned, no matter how good a vision I had of where I was going, no matter, no matter how I did visualizing exercises and prayed and believed, there's definitely still some amount of measured luck in the process. So while you're being the hardest working person you know, try to create opportunities to get lucky. And I scrolled the rest of the way down, and it was attributed to Christine Jones from a book called Women Game Changers. So my first thought was, well, no wonder I liked it. <laughs> and my second thought was, well, what do you know? I'm a meme. <laughs> okay. So now I'm a meme. Do we have time for a few questions? Yes, we do. Even with yes. the fire drill? Even with the fire drill, right. So that, that put us a few minutes behind. We still have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. So uh, we have a microphone right in the center of the room here. So um, And uh, so we ask that you keep in mind as you're asking questions, the two things that make a brief question a brief question, which are that it's brief and that it's phrased as a question, right? So, uh, so keep that in mind. But um, And also I'd like to reserve the first uh, five questions for students if there are five students who would like to ask questions um, that's just a, a rule that we implement at, at our events so um, yeah so uh, feel free to uh, formulate questions and uh, form a line in the in the center here uh, if you'd like to ask Christina a question we can call on people too I'm a law professor you know we do it Socratic over there you want to go to the mic And can you say your name? Of course. My name, let's see. My name is Cameron Lizick. Um, thank you for speaking. I just wanted to ask in regards to the Me Too movement, how do we best support survivors while taking the truth into account? Could you guys all hear that? How do we support survivors while taking the truth into account? Look, everybody, and this is true in the law and in life, everybody is entitled to perceive things from their own filter. And so in the law, we have a concept called the eggshell skull plaintiff because some people are just more sensitive than others. So what seems significant to you may not seem significant to anybody else. And so, and, but you don't get to pick their sensitivity. So I think when you're supporting people, you have to say whatever meets their need, you have to meet. But that doesn't mean whatever is meeting their need rises to the level of something that's actionable, for example. It, it might. But... You have to judge how to serve that person or how to meet that need based on where they sit, not where you sit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, just knock yourself out. Come on up. Uh, so in a world of politics where a character may not seem to matter that much anymore, um, if the view is taken that character should matter, should it take a completed prosecution to push someone out of office or a race? Or are we able to kind of take the general character into assumption and not say that you need the entire truth to be able to push someone out of something like that? We're talking about Kavanaugh? Um, yeah. For example? Kavanaugh, Trump, uh, Al Franken. Wow, that's a whole spectrum you just named right there. <laughs> yeah, well. 
Kavanaugh, Franken, Trump, I don't know where he fits. So you actually get to pick because you get to vote. So nobody can really tell you what the answer to that question is. I can tell you what the law is. Any of the lawyers in the room, we can do the legal analysis right here. Somebody can take the other side. I don't care which side you give me. But I will submit to you that character matters. It does matter. If you knew some of the things that I know about my opponents, you would be devastated to know that they're in office right now. But I also know that the people that talk to you about their experiences may not want to share them publicly. I think what the Judiciary Committee did to Dr. Blasey Ford was abysmal, atrocious. This woman never wanted to be named, let alone testify in public. But she stood there and she told what she believed to be the truth, right? So did the judge. So if you say we're just going to enter into a discussion about character without regard to some standard of conviction, you get yourself on a real slippery slope. The other thing you do is you get yourself into, wedged into a position where you might only ever get rich people in office because they can pay to have somebody else do their dirty work. That's bad. Or you get really uninteresting, boring, non-experienced people that have never done anything interesting in their life. That's also bad. So this is a tension that we can never solve because humans are imperfect. You just have to say, what's bad enough to make me not want to support the person? But <laughs> you have to be really careful about convicting people of crimes without an actual prosecution. Thank you. So dis I would distinguish between crimes and non-crimes. Thank you. That's like three years of law school that, that, to figure that out. Yes, sir. The name's Jonah McCoy, and the question I wanted to pose once was on the matter of is there ever a point where compromising one's morals is a necessity, particularly in the cases where you cannot let the other, the uh, loot winning is, m is, better, uh, is preferable to portraying one's principles in the event of the opposing side winning is more of consequence. This is again gonna sound like a real lawyer weaselly answer, but it just depends. It depends on what, you, what your level of tolerance is. For me, compromising my integrity was not OK. So in the end, the, the stories never came out. Maybe they never will. But that was my decision. So it, basically, you have to pick that as a voter. If you are going to be a candidate or a policymaker, you have to kind of know that going in. Because if you don't draw yourself a line, there's no line, right? It's sort of like if everything is a problem, nothing's a problem. You'll, you'll follow any wind of doctrine if you don't define that for yourself before you get there. Good thing these questions aren't hard. Okay. And, uh, yeah, if, if there are no more students with questions right now, others also feel free to, uh, to raise your hand or come to the center here. My name is Amber. I am not a student, but walking around this campus, I feel much older than I was when I graduated high school. So um, since this is a women in leadership you know, thing, and I really wanted to ask you this, Christine, because I've known you for quite a long time. Um, and for women, sometimes I feel like our definition, the world's definition of us being leaders is very different than a man being a leader because we put sometimes the dreams of our family above our own. So I like when you were telling your story about how you continued to try to get into the DA's office, but you were also a wife, and you also had all these other responsibilities. So how do you find a way to still accomplish your dreams and your goals and become a leader without having to sacrifice feeling like you're not doing what you should in all the other roles of your life? So how do you still be a leader and not let your family um, or your husband or your kids, once some of you get there, kind of intervene in that and keep you from doing what you should do for yourself? How do you draw that line? Well, I'll start where I, or I'll finish where I started, which is I'm not always the smartest guy in the room. Once in a while I get to be, but I'm not always. But I am always, at least in my experience, the hardest working. Mm -hmm. So in my particular case, what I sacrificed was sleep. 
in the interest of family and in the interest of work. I worked at this particular law firm downtown 20 hours a day, seven days a week for five straight years. That's without exaggeration. And that doesn't include all the all-nighters that we put in. So in my particular case, it was sleep. I'm not sure I recommend that. It's not particularly good for your health or your mental disposition or anything else. But if you're going to be a normal human and actually sleep at night, then I think you, again, like we talked about with the gentleman, draw your line. Define that balance for yourself. This whole, fa this whole sort of concept of, of life balance is a, a little bit of a misnomer because you always have to have a priority, right? Mm -hmm. Most mothers, I find, their kids become their highest priority, at least for a time. You have to define that. But you really, again, know before you get there what the answer is. Otherwise, it's, you're going to be guilt riddled, and you're going to be confused, and you're going to be conflicted, and you're going to be pulled in a thousand directions, and none of it's because you're a bad person. You just got to know what your line is before you get there. Got time for one? Any one maybe? more? Two more? Okay. Uh, my name's Edward. Hi, Edward. Um, AOC. She's a new congresswoman from, from New York. I think her last name is Cortez. If she was sitting right here mm -hmm. as a 29-year-old, what advice would you give her? That's a really great question. So he says, what advice would you give AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the new congresswoman from New York? I think having spent a lot of time on the Hill and done a lot of policy development and a lot of coalition building and that sort of thing, my best advice would be Learn how the procedural posture in the House works before you start to try to accomplish too much. Because one of the things you find about working on the Hill is it's, it's a slog. And everything moves slowly. And it's very frustrating if you're a doer, it, particularly if you're a type A OCD CPA lawyer. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's super frustrating. And she's obviously a hard worker. I mean, the woman wore out literally two pairs of shoes she wore holes in the bottom of campaigning, going door to door. She's a hard worker, so she's going to want to get in there and introduce a bunch of legislation and get a bunch of stuff going. My best advice would be just learn to be an expert on the procedural posture because you can. it's just like the law. You can win almost every battle if you know the rules better than the other guys. Yeah. The other thing is in the House, especially, seniority rules the day, so you have to have a champion. You have to have somebody in leadership that's going to pull you along on their coattails, unfortunately, until we have term limits. Yeah. All right, great. Well, I'd encourage everyone to stick around uh, for a while longer. Take a look at uh, the rare original text we have over there. Uh, get another bite to eat. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to attend some of our upcoming other events uh, this semester including our second annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day event, uh, The Real Martin Luther King, which is scheduled for next Tuesday. Also a talk by Arthur Brooks of the American Enterprise Institute and the New York Times next Thursday. And then we have our spring uh, conference um, entitled Polarization and uh, Civil Disagreement Confronting America's Civic Crisis. That's on February 22nd and 23rd, so I'd encourage you to uh, get that on your calendar. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank our outstanding events team, uh, Catherine and Taylor, um, and also um, our academic success coordinator extraordinaire, Susan Kells, for arranging uh, so many aspects of this event and making it possible. Um, also, uh, let's see, uh, Gabby, our student worker back there, our communications coordinator, Lauren, um, and uh, last but not least, our associate director for public programs, Dr. Carol McNamara. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of them for arranging so many different aspects of this event uh, and keeping their cool during the, uh, the fire drill, right? Um, so we didn't plan that. That wasn't part of their planning. It was something that was thrown at them. So thank, thank them all very much for that. Um, so as I said, please continue to stick around and um, talk a little more. And join me, please, in thanking uh, Christine Jones uh, again for, her, for coming. Thank you.